Hey there, my name is Deandra and in this video I'm going to be giving some tips for playing Mercy with every other support. One thing to note, I'm going to assume the Mercy player won't be swapping here. This means for Mercy's non-optimal pairings, I'm just going to roll with it and still give advice. Generally you want to treat damage boost as your default job and push it really hard, but that's not always possible and maybe we can work with it. Let me know in the comments what your favourite Mercy pairing is and let's start strong with Mercy and Anna. You see this pairing constantly because both characters are so popular and I'm a huge fan of it, you really get to play to Mercy's strengths with this one. Generally you want to let Anna heal the tank so she can build nano while you mostly focus on the DPS. A lot of Anna players will actively get annoyed by a Mercy that just yellow beams the tank all game, so try to only do so when that person is under enough pressure that they need you both, like maybe Ryan's shield just broke or if you're desperate for ult charge. I try to check the scoreboard after fights a lot here, and if I've got ult and Anna doesn't, I'll let her do as much cleanup healing as I can. When a teammate is far away and in a dangerous position, I'll look to see if Anna can take care of it rather than immediately go for it without taking the risks into consideration. Now, keep in mind Anna is a somewhat aim intensive hero, and not everyone plays perfectly. I try to gauge the skill of my Anna in case she has any limitations that I can make up for. For example, if she cannot hit our Genji, which honestly kind of fair, then I'll be more attentive with him. I also want to be aware if she can hit a mobile Mercy or if I maybe need to play corners more. You can tell when Anna is scoped in because she'll be hunched over a bit and her shots will have a trail. This can also narrow her vision, for example here I can't see Sojourn while scoped so I'll try to take this into account in case I need to heal someone real quick. Anna's healing is also blocked by shield, so I'll watch out for allies stepping past them or if they've intentionally been cut off. Just in general, it's worth keeping a close eye on Anna because Sleep Dart and Anti Nade have pretty long cooldowns. If I can help her before she has to use them defensively, she can be more aggressive with potentially fight winning utility, and that is huge. The biggest downside to this pairing is that it lacks a defensive ultimate or any immortality based utility, meaning it can be weak to ult spam or things like Nano Blade. You will have these matches where your team is doing amazing, you hold perfectly fine until the last battle before or at overtime, and then four ults come out at once and you lose the fight. Then rinse and repeat for every other checkpoint or objective. It's important to be aware when this is happening and seeing if your team can maybe mix things up. On the bright side though, you may have a lot of mirror matches where the enemy team is also Mercy Anna and has the same weaknesses. As I said earlier, try to enable your Anna to build nano faster and create pressure with damage boost. Moving on, Mercy and Baptiste. I think this pairing can be very good, especially with poke compositions, and Baptiste should give you a lot of opportunities to really push damage boost. I really like hard pocketing a long range DPS, especially from a slight off angle. Now, keep in mind though, some Bat players might struggle to hit heal shots on very mobile or aerial targets. Attending to flying heroes will generally be your job, which I mean is pretty standard for Mercy anyway. Because of this, I generally like to keep track of his immortality field and regenerative burst usage. Baptiste can be pretty good at defending himself, usually depending on the rank, but if regen burst is on cooldown, I may want to keep an eye on him in case he's under attack, especially if he's struggling in general. Plus, without regenerative burst, I know I might not get healed by him unless I'm grounded or playing like this. Baptiste's immortality fields can provide protection for Resurrect. So personally, I feel much more comfortable going for reses where the physical lamp is around a corner like this, rather than just out in the open. It only has 150 HP, which isn't nothing, but it's not a huge amount either, so communication really helps here. I've had matches with Baptiste players that don't talk over voice, and they'll throw lamp like immediately after an ally dies, and god bless their soul, they're only trying to help. However, if I'm busy or just not in position to immediately capitalize on it and enemies are nearby, I might decide it's better to just waste lamp than take a risk I don't want to just so Baptiste doesn't feel bad. Besides that, super jab resin can take you out of vertical range of immortality fields, so keep that in mind. As for Baptiste's ultimate, look for allies using it and damage boost them as the amplification stacks and can be disgusting. One thing that I do think is cautiously worth mentioning is that through window, Mercy only needs 3 headshots to take out a 200 HP squishy. Now I would still prioritise damage boost, but with this, Mercy can get up to 5 ult charge per headshot and 3 per body shot, which could maybe come in handy if you need a clutch Valkyrie or something. And last of all, Baptiste himself can be a really solid damage boost target with good range and shouldn't be underestimated. Moving on, Mercy and Brig, which is a bit of a weird one. One of Brig's specialities is to peel for and defend her other support, which in the past Mercy would generally do herself by being highly mobile. 
Now with Guardian Angel's nerfed cooldown, Mercy benefits a bit better because she's more stationary. I mean, look at half the clips in this video, right? I'm just AFK behind a wall damage boosting. The biggest thing with this pairing is being aware of Briggs Inspire and playing around it. When she doesn't have it up or cannot trigger it, you may need to do more healing, especially before a fight has started when teams have not bridged that gap between them. We don't want Brig to have to use all three repair packs too early because then she may not have them for key moments or to help us personally. Those repair packs are the only quick burst healing we have, so it's important that they're used well. When Brig does have Inspire up, I'll try to ignore small bits of chip damage so I can blue beam instead. Brigida herself is fairly self-sufficient, but I still like to keep an eye on her. When she's badly injured, she may play back behind a corner or be too afraid to lower her shield, meaning Inspire might get dropped. A well-topped up and attended to Brig can play aggressively, which will benefit the whole team really nicely, so make sure you listen out for her shield break voice line. Moving on, Mercy and Iliari. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This pairing revolves heavily around the pylon because Iliari generally wants to place it down and then play aggressively with her damage. Her secondary fire has an output of 120 healing per second, which can be amazing, but it runs out very fast and can have a lot of downtime, so it's not something we can always rely on. It is crucial to keep a close eye on the pylon and almost always know where it is. We need to know who it can reach and, more importantly, who it can't. These two things are constantly changing variables that will influence the decisions that we make. Mercy and Iliari both have a maximum healing range of 15 meters, so if someone is hurt away from the pylon, it's probably up to Mercy to take care of it, whereas someone near the pylon can sometimes be handled by it while we damage boost them. We also want to keep track of whether Iliari can reposition the pylon. For example, if we see her place it down and then allies push past it, we might be more inclined to heal. If the pylon is taking damage, then we know it cannot be moved. When the pylon is destroyed, that's 12 seconds of downtime where I might adjust my positioning and mindset to be more healing focused. Hopefully you get the picture here. Because of all this, I am a bit hesitant to stay with allies that are really far away from the rest of my team, unless our pylon is really safely positioned and everyone else is making use of it. When the pylon is up and active though, it's honestly really good. It is possible for Mercy to still have a really damage boost heavy playstyle when Iliari is out of the fight and coming back from spawn as long as that little gizmo is pumping away, which is somewhat unique to these two. This pairing comes down to both players adapting to each other, I think. If Ilari is going ham on damage, I may need to heal more. If she's smart with her healing usage, I can damage boost a lot. As a blue beam target though, an Ilari with good aim is pretty strong, but there's usually downtime between her shots. This means I generally gravitate towards others unless I think I can time it or see her trying to pressure important targets like a Farah. Ilari's ultimate can be damage boosted and broken down into three parts. The initial shot, the damage needed to trigger Sunstruct, and the Sunstruct explosion damage. There's a bunch of tiny weird interactions here, but the only thing we really need to know is that when damage boosted, Iliari only needs one full charge shot to trigger Sunstruct, so make sure to look out for that. Moving on, Mercy and Kiriko. I don't have a whole lot to say on this one, but I think these two can work very well together because of how flexible Kiriko is. This is another pairing where the other support focuses on damage, the tank and long distance heals, while Mercy Bluebeam's a DPS while keeping an eye on everything else. That being said, Kiriko's papers do have a small bit of travel time, especially when she's far away, so take that into consideration. These two are probably a bit weaker than they used to be with Mercy's damage boost nerf, but I still think it can work out, although it might be more of a struggle if allies are really taking damage. I love to work with Kiriko's teleporter, and sometimes I'll think about how I can be an escape route for her when choosing where to position. When Kiriko dies early and is coming back from spawn, I might try to play far back enough that I can still beam allies while providing her a quick target. This is especially easy when I'm in Valkyrie because the double beam length lets me play from such a distance. If I see Kiriko in an overly aggressive position, I may rely on her to teleport out rather than me coming to her and putting myself in danger while also denying her an escape route. Although if I saw her teleport to that position, maybe to help an overextended ally, then I may try to help where I can, even though her play probably wasn't ideal. If you are beaming Kiriko when she teleports to someone, your beam doesn't instantly break, meaning you can keep up or get an extra long guardian angel. That being said, if you are in Valkyrie with Kiriko as your main beam target and she teleports, she will take your chain beams with her, so maybe be careful about that. As for Kiriko's ultimate, there does seem to be a slight linger when you leave its area of effect, 
effect. Because of this, I may try to peek in and out rather than just stand directly in it so I can maintain distance from my allies. Kitsune Rush does improve Mercy's healing, but it does not affect her damage boost. It's also pretty nice for reducing the cooldown of Resurrect and I guess Sky Nagel if you do a jump. Moving on, Mercy and Life Weaver. The two of them have some fun interactions, like reviving on his pedal platform. Although, keep in mind you do need a living entity to step on it for it to go up, and they made the hitboxes around the edges smaller, so be careful about starting the res from too far away. If Life Weaver pulls you, Mercy can break out of it by using Guardian Angel, however, you will also no longer be immortal, so keep that in mind. The number one thing about this pairing though is that neither Mercy or Life Weaver contribute much or any damage directly themselves. Now compare this to a team running Bap and Alari who could easily rack up 10,000 damage between them. That being said, this doesn't have to be a problem, especially at mid to low ranks where the Kirikos and the Annas could also be heal botting. It does mean you can fall into this place though, where you two do great on defense and no one on your team ever dies, but once it comes to attack, your team suddenly starts struggling and maybe it's not really clear why that is. Aggression is quite often how you make plays, but Life Weaver's kit is generally reactive rather than proactive, same with Mercy's Resurrect, which is a very long-winded way of saying, use damage boost. Like, a lot. Life Weaver will usually be healing, his healing has a lock-on, and he can pull people out of danger. As long as I keep track of life grip usage, I'm usually pretty comfortable aggressively pocketing a DPS or leaving my tank to play aggressively under the watch of Life Weaver while I pocket a DPS from behind them. As for Life Weaver's ultimate, if an ally is full health, then they get this green over health instead, up to a maximum of 100. Now, the tree itself heals for 75 every 1.75 seconds. This means after a pulse, if I see an ally slightly injured, I might try to top them up so they get the over health, although this could mean sacrificing damage boost time, so use your own judgement with this one. Moving on, Mercy and Lucio. <laughs> if you weren't aware, a lot of people really do not like this combination. It is considered one of the worst support pairings because these two sort of have anti-synergy, which is unfortunate because if there's someone even less likely to swap heroes than a Mercy main, it is a Lucio player. Basically, Lucio wants a speed boost, Mercy wants to damage boost, and neither can heal while using that primary utility, meaning allies can get neglected. When these two do heal, it's not a super huge amount either, and both characters also just generally thrive in different team compositions, although that is more of a factor at high ranks. All that being said, this pairing is not doomed to fail, especially at mid to low ranks. It can also work if your team has a lot of self-sustain or knows how to play natural cover. Alternatively, if the enemy team is a bit uncoordinated, that can give some breathing room as well. Lucio's healing probably won't be saving people outside of Ampitub, so prioritize those most in danger of dying or likely to take damage. If both my Sojourn and Mei are injured, I might trust the latter to use Ice Block. Keep in mind, Mercy gets more ult charge from healing than she does from damage boost. This means if you do get stuck healing a lot, you should be building Valkyrie pretty fast. Consider treating Valk like a tempo-y cooldown to stabilize allies or catch up on damage boost, maybe by flicking between the two beam modes. Alternatively, if the Lucio player is actually speed boosting our tank into the enemy team, I might try to damage boost a long range DPS while those two close the distance gap. Once they have, I may flick blue beam onto our tank to add even more pressure. During Lucio's sound barrier, again, I either try to play more aggressively with damage boost, especially if it's been used defensively against an enemy, or use it as a moment to play catch up if health walls are super low. Being aware when you can damage boost injured allies, which I have covered extensively in a past guide, will also go a long way here. Oh, also, Lucio's speed boost makes it easier to accidentally go out of res range and cancel your own reses, so be careful about starting them on the outskirts of max range. Moving on, Mercy and Moira. So this is a pairing that I really like at the metal ranks or in quick play, which is good because you'll probably see it a lot there. Both characters are fairly easy to play with not much mechanical skill needed and high healing output overall. However, as you climb it kind of falls off because utility becomes increasingly more favoured over raw healing. Not to say that it can't work at high ranks, but understand that the lack of anti nade Suzu or whatever can be really noticeable. Basically, my thing is you want to damage boost your heart out, but also keep in mind that Moira has some limitations that you may need to play around. Moira's healing can hit multiple targets and also has a range of 15 meters, just like Mercy. This might be bigger than a lot of players think it is, but if an ally is way outside of that, I would generally try to handle it as Mercy, because GA has a much shorter cooldown than Fate. 
if the enemy team is really aggressive, then I may want Moira to save phase so it can be used as an escape tool. Against some teams, this might not be an issue, but well-coordinated players will actively look for when Moira's fade is on cooldown so they can focus her afterwards, which I keep in the back of my mind somewhere. Plus, sometimes it just won't be practical for Moira to go for it. Moira generally wants the team to play together to capitalise on her AoE healing, which can mean less potential fly paths for Mercy, so try to have a backup plan in mind or position safely around that. Moira's main method of healing is also resource-based, and we want to take that into consideration. When I see her healing someone, and it's pretty easy to notice because it's just like a big cloud, I actively want to ask myself if that person needs us both, or if I can do something else so I'm not stepping on Moira's toes. She does have voice lines for when she runs out of resources. I cannot heal you yet. Which we want to listen out for because we may need to briefly adjust our playstyle afterwards until Moira is back on her feet. Before a fight has started and my team has pushed in, I try to find a balance of damage boosting allies so we get an entry pick, but also healing enough that Moira doesn't use all her resources before we've properly engaged. As a damage boost target, Moira can be pretty decent, especially in the metal ranks. At that sort of level, a bluebeam Moira can be great against sticky, squishy characters like Genji that other allies are struggling to hit, especially during a stall. Even though it might not be the highest damage, the survivability and lack of aim needed means you can win a lot of duels at low ranks solely through a War of Attrition. Coalescence is also great, just keep in mind that both supports focused on a small rectangular zone that allies can easily be outside of. And last of all, Mercy and Zayada. Now, I've always found this to be a very feast or famine pairing. The goal here is to win fights fast, with Discord Orb and damage boost before the lack of healing becomes an issue, which can go either really well or fall apart very quickly. Ideally, your allies should have range and self-sustain to help make this work. It is definitely a bit worse than it used to be since both Mercy and Zen have had nerfs to their damage amplifications, but it's very much still playable. Make sure to look out for the physical purple orb attached to enemies and which allies are attacking them so you can boost their damage even more. Try to keep a close eye on Zenyatta, especially if you're darting about a lot. If you're playing with someone who's skilled enough to take care of and defend themselves, that gives Mercy a lot of breathing room. However, Zen is just sort of slow with a big hitbox and will often be an enemy's first choice of target because of those factors, which is really important to keep in mind. I quite like Zen himself as a damage boost target, especially if your other options don't have much range. I'll look out for him charging volleys and flick my beam onto him just before I think he's going to fire. When Zayana charges a volley, five circles slowly appear above his head, always in the same order. What you can do is watch for the fifth one to appear, the middle one, and flick onto him then, although this only works if he's fully charging it. During Transcendence, I will usually try to completely commit to damage boost on allies affected by it, because there's very little that would need 355 healing per second that 300 healing per second wouldn't already cover. I may then flick back to healing just as Transcendence ends if that person is actively taking a lot of damage. And that is all from me this time. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to check out my other Mercy Guides, and have a nice day.